You know, it says in 2 Peter 1, uh, 1 and 2, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Ooh, look at that. Like they've obtained like precious faith with us. Well, I think Peter had, remember at the gate where the guy asked him, was asking him for money? And he said, I don't, I don't have any money, but I got something else for you. And you guys, he's saying, have obtained that, that same faith. How'd they get it? Through the righteousness of God. I think you should focus on the righteous, the gift of the righteousness of God, the gift of being cleared from all guilt. And our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, then he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. So grace can be multiplied to you. Peace can be multiplied to you, or it cannot be multiplied to you, or you can get none of it, and we all don't get the same amount. And how does that happen? Through knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord. Through knowledge of Jesus, grace is being multiplied right now, because that's what we're talking about. And just coming from a standpoint, almost like a taking off place, when you hear this message, what you should believe, be believing for when you hear about Jesus, when you get good, uh, new knowledge, old knowledge, knowledge you already know, any knowledge of Jesus, your life should get better. That's what it just said. It just said that. Your life should get better. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. What's that mean? Your job should get better. Your marriage should get better. Your relationships should get better. Your health should get better. If peace is multiplied through the knowledge of Jesus, that should quench oppression. Bouts with oppression and depression. The root of those is fear. You know, there, we all need wholeness. There's, there's areas in our lives where we need wholeness. Maybe you're doing a lot better than me, but I know there are places in my life as I stand here in front of you that I need wholeness. So through these messages on Jesus, I'm believing for the same thing. Release your faith for wholeness. The more you know Jesus, the more favor you don't deserve is injected in your life. According to the scripture we just read. We're going to spend a lot of time in the gospel of John because I don't know if you guys realize this, but if you look at like Peter's book or some of the way these other guys write, it's very sharp and to the point, something that would take Peter two verses to explain. It seems if it would take John maybe five or six verses. John just seems to give a lot more details about things. So as we're trying to get into Jesus to his attributes, into detail, into the things that he did. Um, I feel like the best book for the most part to look into is the gospel of John. Many of these, you know, the gospel of John has nine miracles, nine miracles. A lot of times he doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. What John is trying to say is these signs they signify something. It seems as if John is trying to get the point across that these signs seem to represent something about Jesus. So I want to go to the first miracle, John 2, 1. And the third day, the third day. Was that a coincidence? It's the third day. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there on the third day of that wedding I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Cana would be the equivalent of one of those small towns up in northern Minnesota you've never heard of. It was just really, you know, kind of a country place. John uh, 2, 2 through 4, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to Jesus, they have no wine. They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Interestingly enough, this is considered Jesus' first miracle, but why would the mother go straight to him when she realized there was no wine? This is the first recorded miracle 
But why is she coming to him and saying there's no wine? Obviously, she knows what he can do. Do you get what I'm saying? Obviously, she's seen some things before this. She wasn't ignorant of what, she wasn't surprised that day. She's going to him and saying, create more wine, is what she's saying. And that, so I, there, were, there were miracles before this. She knew what he could do, but this is the first recorded miracle. And you know, I just want to point the way, he didn't call his mother woman, all right? Woman. I can't even imagine. If I call my mom, woman. My dad wears his college ring on his finger. I would feel that ring. It's a big, heavy ring from his college. Um, in that culture at that time, it was giving her the highest respect. It actually means madam. That word in the Greek means madam. John 2, 5, his mother saith unto... Okay, wow, wow, how did this go here? Then his mother just turns around. He's like, woman, this has nothing to do with me right now. It's not my time. She just looks at him, looks at the servants in the next verse and says, whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> there wasn't a discussion. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Wasn't even a discussion. She didn't argue with them. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not like Jesus is, is like, interestingly enough, Jesus is kind of saying, I'm not going to do it. It's not my time. But she just ignores it. John 2, 6 says, there were, set, there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. John 2, 7 through 10, Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with the water. They filled them up to the brim. He saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. They say he took a sip, checked it, put his finger in there. And they took it. And when the rule of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. He saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have, have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The first recorded miracle that Jesus ever did, he doesn't even get credit for. The bridegroom got credit. Oh, okay, you know, think about it. How hard is it? I would be like, you know, you know. I wouldn't be able to help myself. Well, you know, I'd, I'd send word up there somehow. I'd be sneaky about how I got the word to the guy that I did it. I mean, you know, John Maxwell says, he says that a leader, it's a mature leader that's able to give credit on a regular basis. You know, I was just thinking about this. Even uh, I, was, I, was, I ran to the store um, for something. I was in my wife's car, and I decided I would fill it up. And I felt so good about myself, and I was like, I'm not going to even tell her. <laughs> you know, sadly enough, I had been home five minutes, and I told her. And I, I, I had made a pact with myself that I was not going to tell her. Just little stuff like that, nothing. A lot of people say God bless. A lot of people uh, say that God blesses you. He wants that glory. You give him the glory because you're speaking it and you're actively building your own faith. You don't see Jesus seeking any glory. You don't hear a word from him. Oftentimes, when he did a miracle, he would say, don't go tell anyone. A number of times he did that. Think about this. You have a God that wants to bless you, that wants to heal you, that wants to make you whole, that wants to d deliver you, um, give to you just because his deep, deep love for you. But you have to understand that love. I don't even like saying blessed to be a blessing. I, honestly, I just don't. Because I've, 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 I've kind of thought it through. It's like God saying, 
It's like God saying, God blessing you so you can go bless someone. Was that the heart of the father and the prodigal son? We just spent two hours and 10 minutes preaching on the prodigal son. After the son had sinned, probably slept with tens, fifties, hundreds of women, spent upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars, immediately that son got home, he restored him with money, honor, and authority on the spot. Oh yeah, he was giving him those things after he had committed so many awful sins because he wanted him to go be a blessing. That's what he says in the story of the prodigal son, correct? Go be a blessing, son. No. Here I, here I am, son, blessing you after all you've gone out, blown over a million bucks, done all these awful sins. I'm giving you money, status, and honor immediately after those sins so you can be, go be a blessing. That wasn't even the point of the story. He said he didn't say that. That was never even brought up. I'm not saying not to be a blessing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, not, I'm saying that shouldn't even be part of your faith. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this and I'm going to do that. No, because you love me. Because you said whatsoever I desire when I pray, believe I receive it. And I shall have it. Why? Because you love me. Look what you did for the prodigal son immediately. But your faith should come from a standpoint of how much he loves you. And how much he wants to lavishly give to you because of that deep, deep love. That's what you release your faith in. Not being a blessing. If you're established in the Father's love, you will more naturally be a blessing. You will want to be a blessing. I'm just saying the motive of God blessing you has nothing to do with whether you're going to bless someone else. Let's go to a scripture proving that. Romans 8, 32. He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Will he not? Why? Because he didn't spare his own son, gave him up for us all. Will he not also with the son, with him, are we talking about Jesus? With Jesus, freely and graciously to give us all other things. Freely, keyword, it's free. It's not to turn around and be a blessing. I'm just going on technicality here. What it says in the scripture. John 2, 3. And when the wine was all gone, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. Interestingly enough, in this culture at a wedding, during that time, it would have brought shame and disgrace on that couple forever if they run out of the wine. It was just the culture. But you look at Mary's communication with Jesus. Have you ever prayed to the Father in a similar way? She said, they're out of wine. The way Mary was communicating with Jesus. Help them, Lord, they have no money. Lord, I don't have a car. My kids don't have any money. I don't have any money to help my kids who don't have any money. God, I'm so depressed. Lord, I'll just be honest with you. I think I hate that person. Mary, in communicating with Jesus, simply made the statement, they have no wine. Have you just ever had, just not had the energy to fight? Just not had the energy to fight to pull the scripture and stand on it, but simply just to make your complaint to God. <laughs> Is all you have left for the situation? Okay, I'm gonna be real straight with you, all right? Um, you remember Billy Brim a few years ago came in? <laughs> and I always remember this. Words like shoot and darn and what the heck. She's saying are basically swear words, you know? And I mean, I'm just a, I say shoot, darn, and what the heck all the time. What the heck? <laughs> all the time, you know? But there's a new one it's called, and I'm sorry, but I'm just being straight. It's used every day. It's called fricking. 
Fricking, F-R-I-C-K-I-N-G, okay? Well, my wife's, or my son's and daughter-in-law's cat, they thought was the kidneys were failing, and it was just a sudden call, and this cat's suddenly gonna die, supposedly, and it's just a big deal. I mean, this cat is a giant white puff ball with an attitude, you know? <laughs> just thinks he's great. I mean, when he, they got a little dog too, and when the cat's gonna punish the dog, this is what he literally does with his paw. He sits there and looks at the dog and goes. <laughs> and then holds it there and then whacks him across the face. <laughs> Money, isn't it? I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna hit you. So. <laughs> but you know what I said when I heard this? I'm this, and this is all I need right now. I said, God, if that freaking cat dies. That's all I had at the time. There were nine things going on. <laughs> and I'm in the middle of something. I said, God, you better heal that cat. And just moved on. You know? Two sentences. He healed the cat, by the way. <laughs> he healed the cat. And so, John. Um, I, you know, I'm not a cat person. They went on their honeymoon, and I had to watch the cat for a week, and I just came to love that cat. And I'm not, I've never spent any time with cats. I always thought they were kind of interesting, but I, I love thinking cats are very entertaining if you watch them closely. But John 2 4, John 2 4. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus, who was part man and part God at the time, said, Madam, what have I to do with thee? In other words, the fact that there's no wine has nothing to do with me. That's what he was saying. It had nothing to do with him. Mary didn't care. She discounted what he said and started instructing the servants what to do. Did she tell Jesus what to do here? She didn't even tell him what to do. There was never a time she told him what to do. She just said they're out of wine. And there, there, there's some kind of understanding um, going on. She didn't acknowledge the fact that he said that doesn't have anything to do with me. The bottom line is she wanted more wine. I'm not saying for herself, okay? <laughs> we don't know if what... If, if it was for herself, or if she knew somebody, or maybe the mother of the bridegroom, or, or the, you know, somebody, and just hated the fact that it was going to run out of wine. We don't know if she was trying to tell Jesus it's time to get rolling with your ministry. We don't know what she wanted, why she wanted it. I guess I'm kind of making the point. If you look at the results here, guys, because God basically told her, and what, what do I have to do with thee? I've got other things going on. Maybe he was trying to say, I'm focused on something else right now, mom. But can we just look at the bottom line? John 2, 11. The beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. So it happened. Didn't he say it had nothing to do with him? Didn't he say it wasn't his time? I think that means it wasn't in his timeline. I think that means it wasn't on his, in his planning. I think that means maybe he wasn't even thinking about that at the, before that time. Interesting, huh? This is God. This is knowledge of Jesus. Your God went ahead and did it anyways, didn't get the credit. If you read it, the bridegroom basically took the credit because he didn't have a response, no response rendered by the bridegroom when he was complimented, how he held the good wine back for later. Seems like the bridegroom just kind of said, yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate that, sir. It was a good idea, wasn't it? 
No matter how minute it is, God cares about what you're praying, what you're praying for. God hears your prayers and wants to answer your prayers. Think about this, you guys. All she had to say was they have no wine. That's all she said. Do you believe God cares about you that much? Let's, let's look at this example. Exodus 2, 23 through 25. It came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed. <sighs> sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. They cried. And the cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. Groaning. What's a groan? Oh. He heard the groan. He heard the groan and remembered his covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He answered a groan and a sigh. He's listening that close. He hears your sigh. He claims to know the number of hairs on your head. Right now, he could tell you how many hairs are on your head. I maintain that God cares about what you care about. I maintain that if God cares about what you care about because of what he said in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares on me. Why? Because I careth, in the Amplified, watchfully, 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 and affectionately. He's not just watching you. He feels affection for you right now, sitting right where you are. Amen. Give me your cares, he says. Isn't it interesting that Jesus' other comment in John 2, 4, my hour is not yet come. Do we have the God that died for this world actually saying the timing isn't right? It's not time yet, mom. It's not my hour. My hour isn't come. Paraphrase that. Timing isn't right. I wonder how many times I've heard that phrase in my life about God's timing. Well, it's just not in God's timing. It's not in God's timing. All the time. Did Jesus say that timing isn't right? He did. Did Jesus go ahead and do it anyways? He did. This is knowledge of Jesus. He came through with that miracle because Mary wanted it done. Even though it had nothing to do with him and the timing wasn't right. Interestingly enough, because of this statement, let's read exactly what he said. He said to her in the King James, in John 2, 4, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Madam, what have I to do with thee? He's saying, you're not concerned. You're concerned about the wine. I don't have anything to do with the wine. And then he says, my hour is not yet come. In other words, you could say, he's saying, it's, it's just not, I mean, it's very clear what he's saying. It's not the right time. It didn't matter. He did it anyways. She didn't have to beg, almost seemed a little overconfident. After he gives the two answers, she looks at the servants and she says, do what, exactly what he says. Now, before I get into this example, this is a very interesting example. Okay? Exodus 32, 8 through 14. But you have to remember when you're reading the Old Covenant, it's the Old Covenant. You're in a better covenant. You're in a different covenant. Jesus was already punished. You can't be punished like they were about to be punished. You can't. Unless you believe you can. Unless you believe you can, and then you're under the curse of the law. Jesus had not given his life. We could not, they could not, we can receive Abraham's blessing. You look at Abraham's blessing. God never corrected him one time. God never corrected Abraham one time. We're supposed to get everything Abraham got. Abraham was rich, and, I'm glad, and the Holy Spirit put it in there. In cattle and silver, it says it. He was the richest man in the Middle East. 
Many scholars believe Abraham was healthy, all his mistakes always. He, can I just say this? This is really, this is, I'll just put it in a worldly kind of way. He made money on all his mistakes. When he lied and sent Sarah into the harem, that, that, that king gave him everything on his way out the door. He was told not to bring Lot with them, lost Lot, Lot gets kidnapped, goes, destroys three, three huge armies with 300 men and becomes an instant billionaire. He wasn't supposed to bring Lot. It was his mistake. Made money on his mistakes. And we have these blessings. We are supposed to walk in these types of blessings through what Jesus did on the cross. All right? And you have to remember that. They didn't have this in what I'm about to, to read. And, and, and I stand by what we talked about last week when my wife said, it's, it's, it's not about getting God to do something in prayer. You're not trying to get God to move. Do you get what I mean? But they're living in a different day. You know, Moses didn't have, you know, Ephesians 3, that prayer says, uh, it says, grant unto us out of the rich treasury of your glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself. It says in the Amplified, indwelling our innermost beings and personalities. Oh, wow. The Holy Spirit can indwell your personality? He can control how you act and what you say. And so, we'll start with verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. This is the Lord. They have made thee a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed unto it. These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of... This is what God's saying. Oh, oh, the molten calf brought you out of Egypt? and parted the Red Sea for you, God was bugged. He was bugged because you know, what he, you know what he said? The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. He's talking to Moses. Now, therefore, let me alone, Moses, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make out of you a great nation. I'm going to start all over, Moses. They're down there worshiping a calf. They think the calf parted the Red Sea. You know? I just want you to focus on the relationship here. Okay? This is a... I mean, listen to what Moses says. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians say, you know what they're going to say about you, Lord? You know what the Egyptians are going to say? They're going to say, for he brought them out of there for mischief to slay them in the mountains. That's why that mean God brought them out of there and to consume them from the face of the earth. And you know what Moses says? Turn from thy fierce wrath, Lord and repent of this evil. Wow. He looked God in the eye and said, you're doing evil. We're just reading the Bible. And repent. I think he was confident in their relationship, was he not? Verse 14, and the Lord repented, changed his mind, of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. I want, just look at the relationship here. Think about this. Don't ever think that your prayers, the prayers of one, can't affect the lives of millions. Because you just see it right here. In a conversation with God, he saved the lives of two million people. In a conversation with God, to think that your prayers can't affect people clear across the world with the power we have now, with God on, he didn't have God on the inside of him and dwelling his personality. He wasn't on the inside of him. And so, oh, I had, I had some great stuff in Genesis, but here, here's the other thing. The Lord said, 
I, I, I think the Lord had decided more or less that the timing is right to be done with the Israelites. Am I right? And Moses, we just saw him talk him out of it. We did. Well, look at, look at Abraham here. In Genesis 18, 17, the Lord said, shall I, oh, what a great story before this. We're leading right into this. A story with Sarah where she's laughing in the tent. And God's like, I'm going to make her have a kid. And she's in the tent going, I'm going to have a kid. I'm like 90. You know, and he's like, why does Sarah laugh? She's like, I didn't laugh. He's like, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> you know what they named their kid? Isaac. You know what it means? Laughter. Think about that relationship. And then, you know, right out of that, the Lord said, shall I hide from my friend and servant, Abraham, what I am going to do? And let's skip to verse 20. And the Lord said, because of the shriek of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. So think about this. He hears it. He hears sin. It's exceedingly grievous. I'm going to go down and, and see whether they have done altogether as vilely and as wickedly as the cry of it, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. And think about this. Abraham, let's say Pastor Edesuji is, is God, you know. Abraham, what does he do? He comes close to him. He comes close to him. He says, will you destroy the righteous, those upright and right standing, together with the wicked? So suppose there are just in the city just 50 people, 50 good people. Will you destroy the place and not spare it for the sake of 50 people? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous fare as do the wicked. Far be it from you. I mean, think about this. Think about the conversation. Shall not the judge of the earth execute judgment, and get this, and do righteously? He's telling God, you need to do right. <laughs> That's what he just told God. He just told God, you need to do right. And the Lord said, if I find in the city of Sodom 50 righteous, upright and right standing with God, I will spare the whole place for their sake. I think God had decided on something and just changed his mind because of his friend talking to him. More respectfully than Moses. Moses, he didn't call him evil. You know? But, you know, you look at this. Abraham talks, well, what if there's 45? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? Gets them all the way down to 10. And then he stopped. I can tell you if he goes to one, he saves the city. And here's the proof. 2 Peter 2, 7, he rescued righteous Lot. There was one in the city. It was Lot. God went down there and got him out of there. Did, we, did they just call Lot righteous? He was a doofus. In God's eyes, Lot was righteous because of who he's related to. Interesting. There's, it's just interesting that why is Lot righteous? Jesus hadn't even died and Lot's righteous? Lot was lit. Look at the city he's living in. They were having sex with animals on a regular basis. The angels came into the city to rescue Lot and they wanted to rape the angels. Then Lot is just hanging out down there with them. Matter of fact, it said he was at the city gates. That means he was one of the leaders of the city. But he is righteous in God's eyes. My point here, look at the relationship. It's obviously in God's timing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, correct? Then, am I correct in saying God was willing to change his timing, at least expressed he was willing to change it. He expressed he was willing to change the plan. 
We're just reading the Bible here. I know this is messing with, the, with some prayer people. I'm, we're just reading the Bible. Sometimes the timing thing can be a wall. Is it his timing? Sometimes uh, the why I, am I praying for that can be a wall. Why am I praying for that? Does God really want me praying for that? Am I being selfish praying for that? Am I asking for too much? Should I even be asking for this? Is this too small a thing for me to be asking for just to make my pet happy? Don't you just want your pet happy sometimes? <laughs> the dog people, yes. Is it too much to ask him, is this shirt okay, God? Lord, please do my hair today. Make my hair look good. I feel like when we do the God's timing thing, oh, it's all in God's timing, you're pushing Jesus to the future. I just don't see a whole lot of scripture saying that at some point you're gonna get that. But I do see he calls himself I am right now. Right now, he's saying I can be your breakthrough right now. Mary did, just didn't say, well, it's just it's not his time. She ordered the servants immediately. She said they have no wine. Then the next thing out of her mouth, she looked at the servant and says, uh, whatever he says unto you, do it. God's timing can be now. If you use this example, because the timing for the wine was now. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Friends. He laid down his life for you. We just read it in Romans. That's why he's going to give you freely all the things he's, he's promised you. That's what he says. But he also calls you friends. John 15, 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard my Father, I have made known unto you. Do you talk to God like a friend? It's a big difference how a servant talks to a master compared to God or to a friend to a friend. Big difference. And I will say there are things that absolutely have to happen in his timing. They have to happen in his timing. I'm not discounting that. I believe that it's there, there are things that your destiny depends on and it may have to happen in his timing. I believe that. But obviously in this case, the wedding running out of wine was important enough to warrant his first recorded miracle. You know, uh, I can sit, sit up here and, and give you principles to success, but, but at the end of the day, it won't change you. I can give you all the rules and the regulations, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change you. What's going to change you is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit inside of you is the only thing that's going to change you. And Paul goes on to say, Philippians 3, 8, Amplified, and 10, and this is a little wordy, but look, listen to this. I count, furthermore, I count everything as a loss. Nothing is compared. It's a possession of the priceless privilege. He calls it an overwhelming privilege. This is in the Greek, what this word privilege. Overwhelming preciousness. Surpassing worth. It's a supreme advantage of knowing Jesus. And becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with Jesus. Understanding him more fully and clearly. For his sake, I've lost everything. Just to know him. Oh, I think this is important because he turns around two verses later and says the same thing. My determined purpose is that I may know him. I know Jesus. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person personally know Jesus more strongly and more clearly. And when that happens, when that happens, in the same way, come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. A revelation of who Jesus Christ is is the only thing in the end that is going to change you. John 2, 6 and Amplified, there were six water pots of stone standing there as Jewish custom of purification. 
Each one hold, held 20 to 30 gallons. Big water pots. We'll say 25 gallons per water pot. John 2, 7 and 8, he said to them, fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. He said, draw out now, bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Isn't it interesting? Because Jesus said he did nothing without hearing from the Father. He obviously, after Mary said, they have no wine. There was no communication. She said, I don't have anything to do with that. That's not the right time. She, she said to the servants, do everything he says to do. He's probably, con okay, Lord. All right, you want me to fill water pots? Because he said he did nothing without consulting the Father, remember? So obviously he asked the Father, is this the one? The very first miracle is changing water to wine. I mean, why not have him pick up a mountain and throw it three miles in front of everybody? Just get, get the thing out of the way. Why not split the Galilee in half like the Red Sea and leave it like that for three days and just stand there and let everyone come see? I think everyone would say, well, that, that guy's God. The very first miracle of our God on this earth was changing six 25-gallon water pots of water filled to the rim, filled to the brim to wine for a wedding. Interestingly enough, Jesus does this first miracle. He's never noticed, completely behind the scenes. Essentially, what he's doing is bringing life to a party. I mean, he's bringing life to a party. I guess you could say Jesus' first miracle had to do with joy. He doesn't get credit. He doesn't get glory. He doesn't get noticed. Just a side note, be creative in your prayer. And thank God for all the things God dealt with concerning you behind the scenes that you don't even know about. Because if you have faith in him and his love for you, you just know in your heart he's keeping you out of a lot of junk, a lot more junk than you're already in. How many car crashes were meant for each one of us with, that we we're supposed to be in, that were set up demonically in the spirit, that were just taken care of by him? We, who knows? I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven, how many? How many times was I supposed to die? He's not like your family members, friend, or people that you're close to that can hold things over your head. You don't owe him anything. He just gives it to you because he loves you. We're talking about relationship with Jesus Christ. I think he showed that by dying on the cross, if we could have the pictures, and going through the horrific death that he'll give and he'll give and he'll give and he'll give. But you have to believe it. And you know what's sad? He gave it. And most of humanity doesn't even believe it. No way 50% of the humanity believes in Jesus Christ. They may know of him, and they chose against it. But he gave it anyway. We have a creative, wonderful, beautiful, loving, humble God. While he could come down in a palace with great pomp, his first bed was an animal feeding trough that looked like a coffin, and of what theologians think, he was born in a small cave. That's what held those animals. That says some things about your God. We expect God to do good for you if you do good for him. But he's actually the complete opposite, where he'll come down, die a horrific 18 to 24 hour tortured death for you, whether you believe or don't believe. He does it anyways. Whether you reject him or not. When you hear Christians, I'm just trying to hang in there. How much easier just to know the fact that no matter what, He's holding on to you. Amen. Hebrews 13, 5 says he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. In the Greek, that means never, not ever. That's what it means in the Greek. Just, just let me close on this. He, 
he takes these 25 large, 25-gallon stone pots that were empty. They started out empty, empty, no joy empty, no contentment empty, no peace empty, no gas in the car empty. And Jesus put some water in the jar. What does the water a type of in the Bible? It's a type of the Holy Spirit. John 4, 14, whosoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no never, be thirsty anymore. But the water I will give him shall become a spring of water welling up, flowing, bubbly, bubbling continually with him unto, unto into for eternal life. Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine that is debauchery, but ever be filled and stimulated by the Holy Spirit. How? Well, it gives you three instructions. Speak out to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Offering praise with voices and making melody with him with uh, all your heart to the Lord. At all times for everything give thanks. So if you're not a big singer, walk around, sing guy, you can thank him. At all times. Be subject to one another. Wow. We just read the Holy Spirit's going to fill you if you'll make yourself subject to one another. So in Jesus, in filling approximately 150 gallons of, of, of wine pots, six pots times 25 gallons per water pot, what's he bringing to the party? I know some of you might be looking at this like it's a worldly type of joy, but he's bringing intoxication, and in essence, the Bible is telling you to be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to get across to you that the happiest you're ever going to be is involving Jesus Christ in your life every day. And you have to, a lot of people don't read this in context, you guys. Read in context. Read, the, you ready? Did you just wave at me? Yes. Okay. Okay, go ahead. No. Um, I just keep thinking, and it's, this might seem totally separate from what your message really is about, but what sticks out to me so much is this is at a wedding. This is at a marriage. It's like, sorry, his first miracle involved marriage. And I think there's a lot of us, a lot of people that need that joy, that joy burst in their wedding, in their marriage. So that's just what's in my heart, and I would love to pray for people tonight if you feel led. Sorry to put that so out So pray there. for people. Uh, for marriages. Okay, you bet. You bet. I'm just real distracted because of these rips in her jeans. I mean, she looks hot. <laughs> Sorry, man. Okay. okay. So, no, I that's... <laughs> Wait, yeah. I haven't even thought about that. No, but I, I think of that, and, you know, I've thought of it before where it's like, I mean... That's how important it is. I mean, this is the very first miracle, and it's at a wedding. And it's like, I feel like a lot of times our marriages have kind of just fallen on the wayside, and we're not expecting that joy. We're not expecting those miracles. And I think God wants to touch marriages. I believe it. Well, then we're going to do it. We're going to pray over people. So you just be, be thinking about that. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a line at the end, and my wife and I are going to lay hands. But, you know, um, please, if there's any more to add, Okay, okay, Ephesians 5, 14 through 16, please add it, all right, because that was very good. It, I, I, I didn't even think of that. It's at a wedding. That has to be a point. God has to be making a point with that, you know? But in context, if you go a few verses earlier where he's talking about be filled with the Holy Spirit, it, it's interesting, he says in verse 14, he says, awake, O sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ shall shine, make dawn upon you and give you light. It all starts with Jesus. Look carefully how you walk, live purposely, worthily, and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. Now, he says how to do this. Making the very most of the time. Oh, I would love to have that in the Amplified I told you I was going to throw you th for, a, for a loop back there. If you could, or if you could give me that in the King James. I, it says, why? It says redeeming the time. I believe it says redeeming the time in King James. I, I could be wrong. 
Well, I think redeeming the time means getting it back. I mean, he redeemed us. He got us back. Are we just saying that if you can fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, you're getting time back? You're getting time back somehow. He's giving you time back. In context, he's saying being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's saying make the most of your time. He's saying buy up each opportunity. Make the most of your time. Buy up each opportunity. Verse 17 says to understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. How? Fill yourself with him. Be drunk with him. It starts with Christ, though, in verse 14, shining, making day dawn upon you. If you don't like singing, making melody in your heart, give thanks. I think if you have, if you have a better chance in verse 21 of being filled with the Holy Spirit, if you can submit yourself to others. That's a good one for me. What does that mean? Take the low road every now and then, Jim. If he didn't let you in, then, then, then you don't have to cut him off two miles down the road. Just, if he cuts you off, you don't have to tailgate him. Just back off. That's a little road for me. <laughs> and I get filled. If Andrew Womack says that all he does is thank God all day long, I challenge you to try it for 10 minutes a day for seven days straight, all the way until next Sunday for 15 to 10 minutes straight. Think of little things. What if you didn't have a car? I know countries where no one has a car. They're considered rich if they're on a moped. If they pull up to the little shack church in the village on a moped, they're considered living well. These countries have no transportation system on some of these Indonesian islands. You don't go to a bus stop. You walk if you don't have a moped. I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just blessed. It's not until you go see other countries, how they're run and how they live and how destitute most of those people are that you start to thank God for this country. You really do. Thank God you can walk every time. And, and it's not like, oh, poor them, healthy me. But when I see someone... And you see it a lot of times at the health club because people, they're hurt and they're trying to, to get themselves better by exercise, right? And you see them barely able to walk, you know? Thank God you can walk. Thank God for good food that you can go home and throw some Doritos on a plate with a bunch of cheese and jalapenos. And put it in the microwave. <laughs> Millions can't do that. Thank God for your health, for your healthy children. Every time I drive by that St. Cloud prison off Highway 10, I thank God I'm not in there. Because I know I could have been. Easily. In the King James, it says redeeming the time. It means getting back time that you've lost by thanking him and submitting yourselves to others, letting Christ shine on your day. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, acknowledge, recognize, acknowledge him, and he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. There was a survey of about 1,000 people in this church about eight months ago. The number one request of what they wanted to hear about was Jesus Christ. The question said, what do you want to hear about preach the most? The number one answer was Jesus. So we're going to do that, and we're going to do it next week. And we're going to do it next week. And so I'm talking to you online, too. I'm talking to you in New Zealand and Canada. Now it's out west, Colorado, in the south, Texas, Texas. 